James William Miller is Australia's least likely sexual assailant and serial killer of young women. James Miller is a homosexual. Yet, by his own admission, in December 1976 and January 1977, he helped the man he loved, Christopher Robin Worrell, dispose of the bodies of seven young women who Worrell had sexually assaulted and then murdered while Miller was waiting nearby. James Miller led police to the buried remains of some of the victims and, for his part in the crimes, is serving six life sentences for murder in South Australia's Yatala prison. But while Miller admits that he drove the vehicle that Worrell used to pick the young women up in and then left Worrell to commit murder in private before returning to the vehicle and driving Worrell and the deceased women to the outskirts of South Australia's capital, Adelaide, and helping to bury their bodies, Miller steadfastly denies helping Worrell abduct the victims or that he assisted in the sexual assaults and murders that followed. The only person who could prove James Miller's innocence is the alleged murderer, 23-year-old Christopher Robin Worrell. But Chris Worrell is dead. James Miller has never had sex with a woman. He's a convicted thief, but he has no record of violence. At the time of the murders, he was 38 years old. I was there at the time, and for that I'm guilty of an unforgivable felony, Miller has said from his Adelaide prison cell. I fully deserve the life sentences I am currently serving. I am serving out a life sentence for Chris. But I never killed any of those girls. That's the truth. Miller has been protesting his innocence of murder for years, on occasion backing up his pleas with rooftop jail protest strikes, including one that lasted for 43 days. But he's been ignored by authorities, and his conviction stands. South Australian Chief Justice Len King agreed that Miller should be granted another hearing on the grounds that the judge at his trial, Mr. Justice Matheson, had instructed the jury to find Miller guilty of murder even though he had pleaded not guilty. The Attorney General, Chris Sumner, refused to grant a retrial. Miller maintained, They can give me life for knowing about the murders and not reporting them, but they charged me with murder as a payback for not informing on Worrell. It's a load of bullshit. At least one of the jurists at my trials knows the truth. In 1987, he, the juror, paid a couple of hundred dollars out of his own pocket to help hire a lawyer to petition the Attorney General for a retrial. If a jurist does this, he must have a fair idea of what really happened. Protesting his innocence, Miller said, Nobody turns into a cold-blooded murderer overnight or helps commit murder. I'm just an ordinary thief, no killer. I've never been a violent man. The Truro serial murders are among the most infamous of Australian serial killings. Seven young women disappeared in Adelaide in the 51 days between December 23, 1976 and February 12, 1977. The skeletal remains of four of the victims were discovered in bush graves over a 12-month period in 1978-79 in the Truro district, 80 kilometers northeast of Adelaide. What was left of Veronica Knight was found by a mushroom picker, William Thomas, on April 25, 1978, in a remote paddock off Swamp Road. Mr. Thomas said he'd seen a leg bone with a shoe attached, which he'd thought to be the leg of a cow. He'd thought about the find for four or five days and had returned on Anzac Day with his wife to check. He'd turned over the bone and seen skin in good condition and toenails painted with nail polish. After he'd found a skull, other bones, a blood stain on the ground and items of clothing, he'd contacted police. Swamp Road is so named because it divides a huge floodplain into two tree-dotted flat paddocks. The area's only permanent inhabitants are mosquitoes and frogs, and the only sign that humans have ever been near the area is the barbed wire fence running along the roadside. It is a perfect place to hide a body. You would only come across it by accident. When the mushroom picker reported the find, Police searched the area thoroughly and found personal effects that would help them identify the victim. There was no reason for them to suspect that there were more bodies in the soggy paddock. Almost a year later, on the 15th of April, 1979, four young bushwalkers discovered a skeleton in the same paddock about a kilometer up Swamp Road from the spot where Veronica Knight was found. From jewelry and clothing found at the scene, police identified the skeleton as that of Sylvia Pittman, 
who had gone missing around Christmas in 1976. That was the same time that Veronica Knight had vanished. Police files revealed that five more young women had disappeared from the area during that period. The officer in charge of the inquiry, Detective Superintendent Kay Harvey, said the police had always considered the disappearance of each girl as suspicious, and their cases had been under constant investigation. He said that about 3,000 people were reported missing each year in South Australia, and that usually all but about 15 of them were located. When none of the girls who had gone missing in that 1976-77 period turned up, he knew it was more than coincidence. Now that he had a good reason to believe that the girls were the victims of a serial killer, Harvey was certain that other bodies would turn up and ordered a search of the paddock by 70 police. We don't know what we'll find, he said. We'll be looking for any clues to the killings of the two girls we've found. But we can't overlook the fact that we may find the bodies of some of these other missing girls. Eleven days later, Superintendent Harvey's suspicions were confirmed when the huge search party discovered two more skeletons in the opposite paddock. They were the remains of Connie Iordanides and Vicky Howell, two of the missing girls. The police were baffled. The fact that the bodies had been there for so long left them few clues. The trail was stone cold. They appealed to the public for help. In May, a woman identifying herself as Angela informed police that she knew of a man who could help them with their investigations. She said that a distraught James Miller had told her about girls being done in in a conversation at a funeral in February 1977. Miller confessed that he and the man whose funeral they were attending, Christopher Worrell, had done something terrible. He also told Angela, Chris had to die. It was eventually revealed that the clandestine Angela was in fact Amelia, who was Christopher Worrell's girlfriend at the time that he was killed. Miller allegedly told Amelia that the bodies were buried near Blanchetown, and she'd not realized that that was near where the bodies had been found until she saw a map of the area in a newspaper. I only had suspicions, but suspicions are not enough to go to the police. I had no facts. I suspected that it was the truth, and I didn't want to go to the police, she said. Miller had told her that the murdered girls were just rags and not worth much. He'd said that one of them even enjoyed it. I did the driving and went along to make sure that nothing went wrong, Miller allegedly told Amelia. They had to be done in so they'd not point the finger at us. If you don't believe me, I'll take you to where they are. It was getting worse lately. It was happening more often. It was perhaps a good thing that Chris died. He also told Amelia that Worrell had done away with two in W.A., the informant said that she'd not come forward with this vital information because she didn't want to daub anyone in. Besides, there wasn't much point in going to the police, as the alleged murderer, Christopher Worrell, was dead. She said that Miller would only be used as a scapegoat. Miller wasn't hard to find. Destitute, he was running odd jobs for Adelaide Central Mission in return for a bed and food at a day center. Eight plainclothes detectives were put on around-the-clock surveillance of Miller, and he was picked up when he tried to make a run for it when he realized that he was being followed. Detained for questioning on May 23, 1979, the detectives heading the investigation, Detective Sergeant Glenn Lowry and Detective Peter Foster of the Major Crime Squad, knew that if they didn't get a full confession, or that if Miller didn't reveal the locations of more bodies, then he could walk out of the police station a free man. There was not one shred of evidence linking him to the killings. All they had to go on was the say-so of the witness. In the first few hours of his interview at Angus Street Police Headquarters, Miller denied any knowledge of the girls or the killings, giving vague and false answers about knowing anyone named Amelia, let alone having a conversation with her. When shown photos of Amelia and Worrell together, Miller suddenly remembered knowing them, and when confronted with Amelia's statement accusing him of murder, Miller said, referring to the $30,000 reward on offer for any information leading to a conviction of the murders, maybe she's short of money, to which Detective Lowry replied, do you really believe that? Is that what you want me to tell the court? Miller then said, no, on second thoughts, maybe she's done what I should do. Can I have a few minutes to think about it? 
A short time later, after being interviewed for six hours, Miller finally said, If I can clear this up, will everyone else be left out of it? I suppose I've got nothing else to look forward to, whatever way it goes. I guess I'm the one who got mixed up in all of this. Where do you want me to start? Miller then continued to make the statement. I drove around with Chris, and we picked up girls around the city. Chris would talk to the girls and get them into the car, and we'd take them for a drive and take them to Truro, and Chris would rape them and kill them. But you've got to believe that I had nothing to do with the actual killings of those girls. A seemingly sympathetic Detective Lowry told Miller that he understood that he was hopelessly in love with Worrell, and that he could see how he would do anything for him. This seemed to give Miller confidence in the detective. All right then, there's three more, Miller said quietly. I'll show you. Detectives Lowry and Foster breathed an enormous sigh of relief, and even though it was 10.30 at night, Miller was driven under heavy escort to Truro, Port Goller, and the Wingfield Dump, where he pointed out the locations of the remains of three more girls. Forensic evidence later showed that the last victim, Deborah Lamb, could have been buried alive. Understandably, the police didn't believe that James Miller had taken no part in the murders, as it was almost impossible to imagine that seven decent young ladies would get into a car with two total strangers and willingly go to their deaths. In most cases, the women involved had other plans, and a casual liaison would appear to have been the last thing on their minds. Debbie Lamb was engaged to be married, Julie Makita was on her way home, and Connie Jordan was waiting for a friend to go to the movies. To the detectives, it looked more like Miller had helped his friend abduct the women against their wills, and more than likely held the victims as they were raped and murdered. Back at the police station, after leading the detectives to the last three bodies, Miller then told his horrifying story from the beginning. James Miller had spent the best part of his 34 years behind bars. Friendless and a loner, Miller was from a family of six kids and had left home at a very early age. At age 11, he was sent to the McGill Reform School, and with no formal education, he resorted to stealing for a living and sometimes worked as an itinerant laborer. In the following years, Miller was convicted on more than 30 occasions for car theft, numerous forms of larceny, and breaking, entering, and stealing. But as Miller strenuously pointed out time and again, he'd never had a conviction for violence or a sexual offense. Miller was doing three months, the shortest custodial sentence he'd ever received, in Adelaide jail for breaking into a gun shop when he met Christopher Worrell, who was awaiting trial on a rape charge. Worrell was also on a two-year suspended sentence for armed robbery at the time of his arrest. The homosexual Miller became infatuated with a handsome young man with long dark hair and slim build, and they became friends. Within a week, they were sharing a cell together. The 20-year-old Christopher Worrell told Miller that he'd never known his real father, and when he was six years old, his mother married his stepfather. Worrell claimed to have served time in the Royal Australian Air Force. Worrell was sentenced to four years on the rape charge and an additional two years for breaching his suspended sentence. When Worrell was sentenced, the judge described him as a depraved and disgusting human being. Both Miller and Worrell were transported to Yatala Prison, where, although they no longer shared a cell, they remained inseparable friends until Miller was released after serving his three months. But it wasn't long before Miller was back at Yatala with his new friend Chris Worrell. This time he got 18 months for stealing 4,000 pairs of sunglasses and offering them for sale in hotels around Adelaide. Nine months after Miller was released, Worrell was granted early parole and they teamed up on the outside where Miller lived with his married sister and her two little girls. Christopher Worrell was a regular visitor to the Miller household and the two men planned on getting a flat together. The passive Miller often performed oral sex on Worrell while he read bondage magazines. But Worrell obviously preferred women and eventually the sexual side of the relationship diminished and they became more like brothers. Soon, they were working together in the same road laboring gang on the Unley Local Council. James Miller described these times as the best in his life. There was nothing that the besotted Miller would not do for his friend, Chris Worrell. However, the relationship was often difficult because Worrell was a very strange and moody person who'd fly into fits of rage over the slightest thing, 
and it took all of Miller's calming persuasion to quiet him down. By now, Chris Worrell was 23 and very good-looking. His natural gift of the gab saw to it that he had no trouble picking up girls. While Miller drove him around in his old 1969 blue and white Valiant car, Worrell would solicit girls at bus stops, hotels, and railway stations. Miller would drive the couple to remote spots and go for a walk while Worrell had sex with the girl in the back of the car. Often, Worrell would tie the girls up. When he thought that they'd be finished, Miller returned to the car and drove them back to town. According to Miller's unsigned statement, this happened many times, and he had no reason to think that Worrell would start killing the girls. By December 1976, Worrell and Miller were still working together as laborers at the Unley Council and were sharing a flat at Ovingham. Every night, Miller would drive Worrell to look for girls. In fact, Miller was so devoted to Worrell that he often slept in the car overnight while his friend was in an apartment with a new girlfriend. Miller said that on the night of Thursday, December 23, 1976, the stores of Adelaide were packed with shoppers buying last-minute Christmas gifts. There were lots of young women about that night, and Worrell told Miller to drive around the main block of the city shopping center while he went for a walk. Worrell often went off on his own. This time, he was quite a while, and Miller had to drive around the block twice before he picked up Worrell and an 18-year-old Veronica Knight at the front of the Majestic Hotel. Veronica had accepted the offer of a lift home. She lived at the nearby Salvation Army Hostel on Angus Street and had become separated from her friend while shopping at the City Cross Arcade. This was when Worrell introduced himself and on the way to her home, the persuasive young man allegedly talked her into going for a drive with them to the Adelaide foothills. Miller pulled the car into a sidetrack and Worrell forced the girl into the back seat. Miller went for a walk to allow his friend some privacy and waited for half an hour before returning to the car. Worrell was sitting in the front seat, and the girl was lying motionless on the floor in the back. She was fully dressed. Worrell told Miller that he'd just raped and murdered the girl. Miller flew into a rage and grabbed Worrell by the shirt. You fool, you fucking fool, he yelled at Worrell. Do you want to ruin everything? While Miller had him by the shirt, Worrell produced a long wooden-handled knife and held it to Miller's throat. He told Miller to let go of him or he would kill him as well. There was no doubt in Miller's mind that Worrell meant it. Worrell directed Miller to drive through Goller and towards Truro a few miles further on. They drove down a dirt track called Swamp Road and pulled over next to a wooded area. When Miller resisted helping Worrell lift the body from the car, Worrell again threatened him with the knife. Then they disposed of the body. He asked me to give him a hand to carry her into the bushes, Miller said. Her hands were tied. He always tied them. We got through the fence and dragged her under. Together, they lay the body on the ground and covered it with branches and leaves. Then they drove back to Adelaide. The following day, they reported for work as if nothing had happened. Worrell, who'd been in a bad mood ever since the killing, was back to his normal effervescent self by the time they reached work. They never discussed the murder. Miller didn't want to raise the subject as he believed that Worrell would kill him. Never at any time did Miller contemplate telling the police of the murder. Had he done so, six more young lives would have been saved. Miller's only concern was his friendship with Worrell. In the future, a jury would consider this when they determined if Miller was guilty of murder. At 9 a.m. on January 2, 1977, Miller dropped Worrell off at the Rundle Mall and agreed to pick him up at the other end. Miller waited for a short time, and Worrell returned with 15-year-old Tanya Kenny, who had just hitchhiked up from Victor Harbor. Worrell had chatted her up in the street. They drove to Miller's sister's home on the pretext of picking up some clothes. After checking that no one was home, Worrell and Tanya went into the house while Miller waited in the car. Eventually, Worrell came out to the car and asked Miller to come inside. From the look on Worrell's face, Miller knew that something was drastically wrong. In the children's playroom, he found Tanya's body bound with rope and gagged with a piece of sticking plaster. She was fully clothed and had been strangled. Miller and Worrell had another violent argument. Again, Worrell threatened to kill him if Miller didn't help him hide the body. Hiding the dead girl in a cupboard, they returned later that night, put the body in the car, 
and drove to Wingfield at the back of the Dean Rifle Range. Here they buried Tanya in a shallow grave that they dug earlier in the day. Miller maintained that he helped bury the body because he didn't want to get his sister involved. On the way back from disposing of the body, Miller suggested to Worrell that he should see a doctor and try to find out what was making him commit the horrible murders. Worrell told him to mind his own business. Again, Miller could have stopped the murders there and then simply by going to the police. But he didn't. He later claimed that his attachment to Christopher Worrell, who was the only friend he'd ever had, was the one thing that mattered in his life. The killings would continue. And rather than be without his friend, the besotted Miller would allow them to go on. With the second murder behind them, Miller and Worrell continued to pick up girls every night. Their favorite spots were the Adelaide Railway Station, Rundle Mall, hotels in the city, and the Mediterranean and Buckingham Arms hotels. Miller never played any part in the soliciting of the girls. He claimed that he was just the chauffeur and the mug. On January 21, 1977, they met 16-year-old Juliet Makita at the Ambassador's Hotel in King William Street. She'd just rung her parents to tell them that she was going to be a little late getting home and that they were not to worry. Juliet was a student at Marston High School and had taken a job in the holidays selling jewelry from a curbside stall in the city. She was sitting on the steps of the hotel waiting for a bus at 9 p.m. when Worrell offered her a lift. Miller drove to one of their usual spots along the secluded Port Wakefield Road, and Worrell forced the girl into the back seat while Miller sat in the front, waiting to be told to leave. While he was sitting there, Worrell started to tie the girl up. She offered resistance, but Worrell was too strong. Miller said he didn't find anything unusual about Worrell tying the girl up. He'd done it to lots of them before, but usually with willing partners. It turned him on. It was his kink. Miller got out of the car and walked about 50 meters away. He heard voices and turned to see the girl out of the car and falling forward to the ground as if she'd been kicked in the stomach. Worrell rolled her over with his foot, knelt on her stomach, and strangled her with a length of rope. Miller claimed he grabbed Worrell's arm and tried to drag him off the girl but Worrell pushed him away and threatened to kill him if he interfered. Miller shook his head and walked away. When he came back, the body was already in the back of the car. Worrell was in a black mood, and Miller did as he demanded. He drove the car to Truro, but avoided going near the other bodies and went to a deserted farmhouse on a completely different track away from Swamp Road. From there, they carried the fully clothed body into the thick trees and covered it with branches and leaves. They then drove back to Adelaide. On February 6, Miller and Worrell picked up 16-year-old Sylvia Pittman as she waited for a train at Adelaide Station. They drove to the Windang area, where Worrell instructed Miller to go for a walk as soon as they arrived. After half an hour, Miller returned to find the girl lying face down on the back seat with a rug over her. She'd been strangled with her own pantyhose. Worrell was impossible to talk to. He'd lapsed into one of the moods that always occurred after a murder. Miller didn't say a word, and they drove in silence to Truro, where they unloaded the body. She was fully clothed and was not tied or gagged. They covered the corpse with leaves and branches and headed back to Adelaide. The following day, February 7, 1977, Worrell told Miller to pick him up at the Adelaide Post Office building at 7 p.m. With Worrell was 26-year-old Vicki Howell, Vicky was older than the others, and Miller took a liking to her straight away. Vicky seemed to have a few worries and mentioned that she was separated from her husband. Miller silently hoped that Worrell wouldn't kill her. She seemed completely at ease. Worrell even had Miller stop the car so the girl could use the toilet at Nuriutpa. A little further on, Miller stopped the car, and leaving the couple to chat, he went to the bushes to relieve himself. He returned a few minutes later on the pretext that he'd forgotten his cigarettes. He was really checking to see if the girl was all right. She was nice. He didn't want Worrell to kill her. Miller assumed that Vicky would not be murdered and walked away into the bush. Worrell didn't appear to be in one of his moods. When he was satisfied that they'd had enough time to talk, Miller returned to the car to find Worrell kneeling on the front seat and leaning into the back. He was covering Vicky Howell's body with a blanket. She had been strangled. 
Miller could not control his anger. He cursed and abused Worrell for what he'd done. It was not necessary to kill the girl. He could have just talked to her and let her go without fear of reprisal. After Miller had vented his rage, he went quiet, terrified that Worrell would kill him too. He meekly asked Worrell why he had to kill the girl. Worrell gave no excuse. Instead, he told Miller to drive to Truro. Miller was terrified of Worrell and did as he bade. At Truro, they hid the body under foliage before driving back to Adelaide. Two days later, on February 9th, Miller and Worrell were cruising in the center of Adelaide when they spotted 16-year-old Connie Iredanades standing on the footpath laughing and giggling to herself. They did a U-turn, pulled up in front of the girl and asked if she wanted a lift. She accepted and sat in the front between the two men. Connie became frightened when the car headed in the opposite direction. Miller stopped at secluded Wingfield and Worrell forced the screaming girl into the back seat. Miller did nothing to help the girl and got out and walked away from the car. When he returned to the car, Connie Iordanades was dead. Worrell had strangled and raped her. She was on the back seat covered with a blanket. Again, Worrell was in a foul mood and Miller was too terrified to say anything. He did as he was instructed and dumped the fully clothed body under bushes at Truro. That night, Miller and Worrell slept in the car at Victoria Park Racecourse. On February 12, 1977, they committed their fourth murder in a week. In the early hours of Sunday morning, Miller and Worrell were cruising in the vicinity of the pinball arcades at the City Bowl and picked up 20-year-old hitchhiker Deborah Lamb. Worrell suggested that they could take her to Port Gawler, and the girl allegedly accepted the ride. Once they reached the beach at Port Gawler, Miller left them alone and went for a walk in the scrub. When he returned to the car, Worrell was standing in front of it, filling in a hole in the sand by pushing sand into it with his feet. The girl was nowhere to be seen. At Miller's trial, Dr. C. H. Manuk, the Director of Forensic Pathology at the Institute of Medical and Veterinary Science, said it was possible that Deborah Lamb had been alive when placed in the grave. The sand and shell grit would have formed an obstruction in the airway and prevented air from entering the air passages, he said. He added that it was impossible to say this positively because of the advanced state of decomposition of soft tissue when the body was found. Dr. Manuk saw a pair of pantyhose found wrapped seven times around the mouth and jaw of Deborah Lamb's remains that could have caused death by asphyxia. If he chose to, Miller could have saved all the victims' lives, but he said that he was terrified that Worrell would kill him if he did. Miller maintained that he did not see Deborah's body in the grave, but later he'd lead police to it. Detective Sergeant Lowry said that Miller had said towards the end of the interrogation, I know it might sound crazy after all this. I don't hold to murder. I really believe in the death penalty. An eye for an eye. Believe me, I wanted no part of this. It was like a nightmare. Each time we picked up one of those girls, I had no idea of his intentions. While returning from Mount Gambier on Saturday, February 19th, 1977, Christopher Worrell was killed in a car accident. A female passenger in the car, Deborah Scoos, was also killed. James Miller escaped with a fractured shoulder. Miller and Worrell had become friendly with Deborah Scoos when they first went to visit her boyfriend whom they'd known in jail, only to find out that he'd walked out on her. To help Debbie get over losing her boyfriend, they'd taken her to Mount Gambier for the weekend. But Worrell had become moody, and they decided to return to Adelaide on the Saturday afternoon. Later in the afternoon, Worrell was at the wheel after drinking several cans of beer and was driving recklessly through countryside north of Millicent. Debbie begged for him to slow down, and a row ensued with Worrell screaming at the distraught girl, and telling her to shut up. Then Worrell yelled, We've got a blowout! And the car careened out of control onto the other side of the road into oncoming traffic. In an effort to avoid a head-on collision with a vehicle coming the other way, Worrell careened the old Valiant off the side of the road where it spun over and over many times until it came to rest with the three occupants spilled out onto the grass. The accident had been witnessed by several bystanders who immediately ran to the scene, but there was little they could do. Deborah Skews and Christopher Worrell were dead where they lay. James Miller suffered a shoulder injury and was taken to hospital in shock. It was his worst nightmare come true. 
the one and only friend he'd ever had in the world, was dead. At his funeral, a distraught Miller spoke with Chris Worrell's girlfriend, Amelia, who would later come forward as Angela, and told her that Worrell had had a suspected blood clot on the brain. This prompted Miller to tell Amelia that Worrell had been murdering young girls and that maybe the blood clot had caused him to commit these horrendous crimes. Although Amelia had been seeing Worrell for only a short time, she had liked him very much and was deeply distressed by his death. Amelia kept her dark secret until the skeleton started turning up almost two years later. Then she told police about what James Miller had told her at the funeral. In her statement to the police, Amelia claimed that Miller had said the victims were only rags and weren't worth much. She also claimed that Miller had said they had to be done in so that they could not point the finger at us. Miller strenuously denied ever making either statement. After Worrell's death, Miller moved from place to place, sometimes sleeping in abandoned cars and at other times staying at the St. Vincent de Paul and the Central Mission Day Center. With Worrell dead and Miller living the life of a transient, it's highly likely that the murders would have gone unsolved if Amelia hadn't come forward. At his trial in February 1980, Miller pleaded not guilty to seven counts of murder. He sat quietly as the prosecution tore his defense apart. The Crown Prosecutor, Mr. B.J. Jennings, was merciless in his attack, claiming that Miller and Worrell had lived, worked, and indeed committed murder together. He alleged that it was a joint enterprise, that they pick up girls and murder them. He referred to the girls as rags. That was the attitude that led him to throw in his lot with Worrell, he said. No rapist and murderer could have had a more faithful or obliging ally. Mr. Jennings continued, You'll never know the truth, but have no doubt that it's a horrible truth that these young women were murdered because they were going to point the finger at the young man who tied them up and sexually abused them. They could also point the finger at the older man who ignored their plight and their terror. If a man assists another by driving him to a place where a girl's going to be raped and killed, then he is guilty of murder. It was obvious, Mr. Jennings said, that no one could possibly believe the girls had been willing partners in their own murders and that Worrell had never used any force. This is what Miller would have the court believe. Mr. Jennings went on to say that the Crown rejected the claims that Miller had played no part in the sexual prelude to the girls' deaths. He said that three of the victims had been dumped partly clothed. They were Tanya Kenny, who was found only in a shirt, Vicki Howell, who was found only in shorts, and Deborah Lamb, who was buried only in pantyhose. Counsel for the defense, Mr. K.P. Duggan, QC, said that there was a tendency to use Miller as a scapegoat. He was just waiting for Worrell, and there was no joint enterprise as far as he was concerned. Miller had found himself in one of the oldest relationship problems in the world, that of the involvement in the wrongdoing of someone else. He was trapped in a web of circumstance. Although Miller admits that he handled the situation incorrectly, he maintains that he is not a murderer. The jury did not agree with the defense, and on March 12, 1980, Miller was found guilty of six counts of murder. He was found not guilty of the murder of the first victim, Veronica Knight. The jury agreed that he did not know that Worrell intended to murder the girl. Mr. Justice Matheson sentenced Miller to the maximum term of six life sentences. As Miller was led from the court, he snarled at Detective Sergeant Lowry, You filthy liar, Lowry. You mongrel. If anyone in the courtroom had any compassion for Miller, it must have been dispelled in July 1984 when Miller was interviewed in prison after his 43-day hunger strike. Chris Worrell was my best friend in the world, he said. If he'd lived, maybe 70 would have been killed, and I wouldn't have ever daubed him in. In late 1999, James Miller applied to have a non-parole period set in the hope that one day he may be released. On February the 8th, 2000, Chief Justice John Doyle of the South Australian Supreme Court granted Miller a non-parole period of 35 years from the date of his arrest. Miller, who'd been one of the longest-serving prisoners in the state, passed away on the 21st of October 2008 at the age of 68 due to liver failure caused by complications from hepatitis C. Additionally, he'd been battling prostate cancer and lung cancer. Thank you.